Welcome to the Makerspaces Supporting an Entre Entrepreneurial System. Uh, today we have several presenters for this webinar. Um, we're pretty excited about this one. It's an emerging new area of interest for a lot of um, economic development folks across the state. And REI, uh, the program that is supporting this, started about 2011 in October 2011 and um, we're supported through the U.S. Department of Commerce Economic Development Administration. And we will be doing these types of webinars every year. Um, it's on a cyclical um, basis. And each co-learning plan that we support uh, is, is required to do a webinar. And we're hoping that every one of our topics of our webinars is helpful and useful to um, those working in, in business support or leadership. Um, so this one, I think, is, is, is a real key topic for, for everybody. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time here introducing our presenters. They all work uh, for the city of East Lansing. And um, the co-learning plan that they're working on together is, is an overview of the makerspace movement. It's an initiative that supports the creative, well, makerspaces are an initiative that supports the creative process and innovation through providing workshop space for amateurs and professionals interested in all sorts of areas of like electronics and robotics and software and wood and metalworking and art. Um, I've, I've heard that there are a different, different types of makerspaces for different age groups um, and our presenters today will cover probably quite a bit of that but more of the information will be found in their co-learning plan which we hope to have provided on our website sometime probably in August um, and they will also be at the summit. I'm hoping all three of them will be presenting on September 4th in um, the Kellogg Hotel and Conference Center here in East Lansing. If you're, you're not um, aware of this summit, you need to be because this is really, really where you're going to see the most innovative ideas, kind of more cutting edge thinking. Um, some, some of the sessions will be from innovative practices that are currently taking place and then some of the sessions will be on um, really ideas that have not emerged into anything bigger yet but that maybe we hope to or that could turn into something larger. Um, so Christina Benton is our lead author on the co-learning plan. Um, she's a PhD candidate in the Department of Geography at Michigan State University and a graduate of the, Ma of the Master in Urban Regional Planning program. In her academic work, Christina wrote several research projects and presented to several conferences. And she taught the Economics of Planning and Development course at MSU in the fall of 2012. Um, since 2007, she has been working as a community development assistant in the Department of Planning, Building, and Development with the City of East Lansing. In this position, she assisted in the implementation of several economic development programs, including the Technology Innovation Center, and has completed several community and economic development reports. Lori Mullins, also with East Lansing, um, is the Community and Economic Development Administrator for the City of East Lansing, and she leads a team of three full-time employees, and she's responsible for administering activities related to economic development and business development for the city, as well as um, administrating the city's community development block grant program. Her experiences leading the city's previous comprehensive planning efforts um, are providing staff and providing staff support to multiple boards and commissions and working with multidisciplinary teams to implement capital improvement projects. And our third presenter, Kristen Shelley, is the director of the East Lansing Public Library. And I think you'll learn from today's presentation that libraries are becoming very interested and very instrumental in um, these maker spaces. So this is, this is really neat that we can have someone from the library um, arena to kind of talk about it. While at the ELPL, which is the East Lansing Public Library, Kristen has implemented a self-checkout and self-pickup holds collaborated with an area church to offer after-school teen programming and begun an aggressively uh, aggressive fundraising, introduced a new downloadable ebook platform, and began using iPads to facilitate more proactive customer service. So she's an active member of the One Book, One Community Committee. Um, this is part of the Rotary Club. 
and before moving to Michigan in 2011, she worked at the Worthington Libraries in Worthington, Ohio as the Deputy Director. So, I'll let the ladies begin, and um, if you have questions or comments, please type them into the, the question or chat box, and we'll probably um, have about 20, 30 minutes, depending on how long the presentation takes. Um, they'll be answering your questions and comments at that time at the end. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Christina Benton, Community Development Assistant uh, for the City of East Lansing. Thank you for tuning in for our presentation on Makerspaces and how it supports an entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem. So today we would like to share with you the findings of our coloring plan. Uh, the City of East Lansing received a grant from the U.S. Department of Commerce uh, Economic Development Administration and the MSUEDA University Center for Regional uh, Economic Innovation, the REI, at the MSU Center for Community and Economic Development. And this grant is to work on our coloring plan on makerspaces. We would like to extend our gratitude to our funding sources and um, to all our supporters for making this study possible. Uh, the presenters for this webinar include myself, Lori Mullins, uh, the Community and Economic Development Administrator for the City of East Lansing, and Christine Shelley, Director of the East Lansing Public Library. Um, so before we start, I'd like to briefly uh, go over the presentation outline. Uh, I'll start with a quick overview of our research. Uh, then Lori Mullins will talk more about the role of makerspaces in economic development. And next, we will, I will introduce the concept of makerspaces and provide some examples and general characteristics about makerspaces. After that, Christine Shelley will talk more about public libraries and the maker movement and provide some examples of makerspaces within public libraries. At the end, I will wrap up with our co-learning plan recommendations. As mentioned earlier, the City of East Lansing received uh, a grant to review innovative practices in building an entrepreneurial ecosystem based on talent, innovation, and creativity that fosters a vibrant local economy with a goal to provide actionable recommendations for East Lansing and interested communities. For this co-learning plan, we researched the makerspace concept and assessed how it functions to support innovation at the local level. Um, what is a makerspace, you might be asking? A makerspace is an initiative that supports the creative process and personal growth through providing a workshop space where amateurs and professionals interested in various fields such as electronics, robotics, software, wood, metalworking, art, video, photography, could expand their skills, invent, and build new products in a collaborative environment. And from the beginning of our study, it became apparent that public libraries emerged at, as leading partners in the makerspace movement. Um, therefore, we believe that the makerspace program developed by a local public library is an appropriate direction in furthering the innovation ecosystem uh, of our community. A public library can develop making programs that will be accessible to children, young adults, and families, and result in more opportunities for innovation and creativity in our community. In our study, we recommend the creation of a partnership uh, network, a critical component in the design and implementation of a makerspace program at the public library. After this brief overview of our research, I'm turning now to Lori Mullins, who will talk more about makerspaces in relation to economic development efforts to foster innovation and entrepreneurship. Thank you. Yes, from my perspective as the City of East Lansing's Community and Economic Development Administrator, creation of a makerspace in East Lansing is a logical progression of our ongoing economic development and business development efforts. It all starts with our comprehensive plan. This is our guide for where, this is our guide for where we are going as a community, and in our 2006 plan, we talk about the knowledge-based economy, and we say that we will research and facilitate community characteristics that promote the incubation of technology businesses in East Lansing. What we as a community were saying in this action item was, let's create an environment that fosters innovation. We've talked many times since then about the importance of a culture of innovation. From that innovation comes businesses and jobs. So we started by creating a technology innovation center, the TIC, in 2008. And these are some of the startup companies 
that have received incubation and acceleration services there. The TIG is supported by our Downtown Development Authority and our Smart Zone LDFA. We have great partnerships with Michigan State University and with the Lansing Economic Par Area Partnership, LEAP, among others, that have dramatically impacted the success of the effort over the four years that it has been in existence. The TIG's main objectives are to one, identify and support high technology business opportunities, two, to promote sustainable economic development in the region, and three, to support the business community by providing affordable office space and services, training, and networking for, of professional advisors. So the TIC is about business development, but what about pure innovation, innovation and creation? As we're working on an update to our comprehensive plan, the culture of innovation is still paramount. But we recognize that not all innovation support is business support. We need to address innovation at multiple levels and support our community members where they are in the development of new and progressive ideas. Ultimately, it's about people and places. These are people in our public library, which you'll hear about more later. We envision a future where creative individuals who don't own a business can explore their ideas and collaborate in a collaborative environment. They can adapt old tools to do new things or invent something completely new. The business development side of me says then we can help them to market their ideas and create new businesses and new jobs and more wealth will come to our town. Some of that may happen, but more often it will be one person with an idea that wants to explore that and maybe has one application. Um, but the beauty of the makerspace is that when people work together and share ideas, more ideas are generated and that culture of innovation grows. With that, I'll pass the presentation on to Christina to tell you more about the research. Thank you, Lori. Uh, now I would like to talk more about makerspaces in general. Uh, numerous maker groups can be found across the nation and the world. Uh, makerspaces are places where like-minded persons gather to work on personal projects, share tools and expertise, as well as learn from each other. The driving principle of makerspaces is that users enjoy sharing tools, equipment, expertise, and ideas rather than working by themselves in the garage or basement of their house. Maker Media uh, defines makerspaces as learning environments rich with possibilities that serve as gathering points where communities of new and experienced makers connect to work on real and personally meaningful projects informed by helpful mentors and expertise using new technologies and traditional tools. So in general, makerspaces display different legal structures, different projects and tools, and different mentorship programs. The scope of a makerspace is driven by its members and their creative needs. The interests of makerspace users vary and includes, as we mentioned before, electronics, milling, machining, craft, scrapbooking, woodworking, ceramics, sewing, design, and much more. Makerspaces allow members to pursue their creative needs in a collaborative environment. And mainly, many of, their, of the makerspaces provide numerous learning opportunities through classes and demonstrations. In many cases, members have day jobs but prefer to join ma makerspaces for their creativity needs. And many members represent independent uh, local small businesses. Uh, I would like to add that there are some several, several initiatives similar to makerspaces, such as, such as hackerspaces, fab labs, and tech shops. Uh, inspired by several groups in Europe, the first hackerspace opened in the U.S. in the late 2007, um, but since then there, were, there was a tremendous growth of hackerspaces and makerspaces all around the U.S. and Michigan. A hackerspace is a membership-based workshop where people with interest in computers, technology, digital, and electronic art can meet and collaborate. Uh, another similar initiative is a fab lab or fabrication laboratory, which provides digital technologies and machines that allow users to develop products and move ideas to, to market. Examples of fab labs include uh, the Mott Community College Fab Lab and the MIT Center for Bits and Atoms. Uh, another similar initiative is a tech shop a commercial venture that combines the concepts of hackerspaces, fab lab, prototype, prototyping studio, and learning center. And there are several uh, locations in the U.S. currently, including one in Michigan, uh, where Tech Shop partnered with 
Ford Modern Company to open a tech shop location adjacent to Ford's Deborn um, product development campus. So makerspaces, um, modeled after hackerspaces, are also the result of the efforts of uh, Make Magazine, which started in 2005 to promote do-it-yourself projects. Um, and Maker Media publishes the Make Magazine, organizes maker fairs, and supports the maker movement through tools, kits, and uh, books. Next, I would like to present a few examples of makerspaces from around the U.S. Um, and Michigan. And um, I'll start with Sector 67 in Madison, Wisconsin, which is a nonprofit collaborative space uh, housed in a 6,600 square feet building. Uh, here, members pay a fee, which allows access to the space, tools, and equipment for persons interested in software, hardware, electronics, art, sewing, pottery, glass, metalwork, iPhone, Android applications, and games. The Makerspace has many supporters in the community and has received grants as well as donated tools and equipment. Another Makerspace is the Milwaukee Makerspace in Wisconsin. Uh, which defined itself as a social club for people that like to build, invent, tinker, and collect new skills and expand their minds. They have a diverse number of members, uh, including people interested in electronics, robots, woodworking, embedded software, uh, metalworking, music, art, video, photography, electric cars, and much more. Funded in 2009, the Milwaukee Makerspace expanded and moved into a larger building in 2012 due to increased membership. Another example is uh, LA Makerspace in Los Angeles, California, which is a nonprofit member-driven community space, um, which it, they are now in, uh, currently in the process of getting a 501c3 uh, nonprofit status. And they provide lots of classes in programming, um, Arduino, fashion tech, soldering, um, circuits, and more. Here in Michigan, uh, we have the M Mount Elliot Makerspace, uh, which was created in 2010 in Detroit as a community workshop where people make, tinker, and learn uh, together. The space houses a wood shop, a bike repair, uh, screen printing equipment, and electronics, uh, and they focus their programs on young adults. Uh, here, there are many local partners associated with uh, the Makerspace, and they have received financial support from several foundations and national programs, including the Kreskev Foundation, Cognizant Technology Solutions, and the Knight Foundation. There are makerspaces in Ann Arbor as well. Uh, one of them is the MakerWorks, a for-profit makerspace, which was created in 2012. And it is located in a 11,000 um, square foot space and features four areas of interest, metals, uh, circuits, wood and craft, and they provide numerous classes. Uh, as well. Here in Lansing, uh, the Lansing Makers Network was established in the early 2012 by a group of Lansing inventors and makers groups. Uh, this year, the group applied for 501c3 status and moved into a list space. Uh, these are photos from the MSU Science Festival where the group had many hands-on uh, activities for children and uh, adults. Having said that, um, I would like to kind of wrap up the discussion on makerspaces with a few general characteristics of makerspaces. In terms of legal status and governance, uh, the majority of the makerspace groups are standalone organizations organized in, as 501c3 nonprofit organizations and governed by elected boards who are um, selected by active members, such as the, the Lansing Makers Network. Some are organized as for-profit entities, such as the um, Maker Works in Ann Arbor, and some are created inside an existing organization, such as a university, a public library, uh, museums. We will talk more about um, makerspaces in public libraries um, next. In terms of membership fees and benefits, um, membership fees are provide a main income for a makerspace. Um, some groups accept donation, uh, additional donations and sponsorship. In general, the makerspace monthly dues are between $50 and $175, depending on the program. Um, some makerspaces have a single membership rate. Some have sliding skills based on the ability to pay by month for an entire year, 
or for different levels of access to the makerspace, um, for part-time, for students, for families. Uh, many makerspaces raise revenues through classes and outreach events. The majority of makerspace programs start, start small usually in garages or coffee shops and they eventually move to bigger locations as their membership grows and their space equipment requirements and assets also grow. The equipment list of the makerspaces grow also based on the, the members needs and projects. In general makerspaces have tools necessary for woodworking, metalworking, welding, electronics, crafting, robotics, sewing and other creative activities. And many makerspaces have 3D printers, laser cutters, uh, vinyl cutters, uh, t-shirt press and, and such. In terms of outreach activities, makerspaces of, offer numerous classes for a wide variety of machines and practices to community members depending on their expertise and interest. These outreach events are important to attract members, funding and donations in addition to developing community partnerships with private and institutional partners. Safety aspects are uh, important uh, to be considered in this case due to the nature of the equipment and the activities performed and training on specific tools and liability insurance are critical um, in this aspect. Uh, projects in makerspace groups tend to uh, develop organically. Some of the resulting projects led to successful startups such as the Dodo case uh, at the tech shop uh, Menlo Park in California. Some of the projects are not immediately commercializable technologies and are showcased at the maker fairs. Some makerspaces design and build things directly for consumers and businesses. Um, and some examples of such projects included 3D printable prosthetic hand, uh, LED headlights, glass objects, um, electronic, electric motorcycle and, and such. Talking about maker fairs, um, they are organized by the maker media and they showcase maker events as well as celebrate innovation and the do-it-yourself culture. Annual maker fair events take place all over the U.S., including at the Harry Ford Museum in Deborn, uh, Michigan, uh, which will take actually place in July 27th through 28th um, in a couple of weeks. The pictures on the screen are taken from the Bay Area maker fair. Uh, this summer and show how this uh, event attract a diverse audience and present projects ranging from traditional crafts to advanced technology and robots geared to attract all ages. Next, Kristin Shelley, Director of Lace Lansing Public Library, will talk more about the public libraries and the maker movement and provide some examples of paper uh, maker events and public libraries around the U.S. and Michigan. Hello, I'm Kristen Shelley with the East Lansing Public Library. Um, but you may be wondering why public libraries and why public libraries and maker spaces. And um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, during the um, most recent recession, and actually during every recession in the Great Depression, libraries have been there. And libraries had, um, even in the Great Depression, libraries doors did not close, even we, though we were hit very hard. hard. Um, however, during this, this most recent um, recession, libraries hours were reduced, staff were reduced, and actual libraries closed. So libraries had to completely retool themselves and completely think um, beyond our bricks and mortar buildings and beyond just being books. And this whole maker movement is part of that retooling. Um, libraries have long um, since um, provided and been open to everyone and provided space for the general public to come in and to research and to get information. Um, however, like I said, we're retooling ourselves and we've had to completely kind of change our brand from going um, from books to information. So we are branding ourselves as information providers and information disseminators. But to move even beyond that, we want um, our patrons and our community to be information producers and not just consuming. Um, and libraries make sense because we have the books, the DVDs, the databases to facilitate maker learning, a maker learning environment. 
Um, and for years and years and years, libraries have done maker programs. Um, we just didn't call them maker programs. Now that is, um, you know, for lack of a better term, the new sexy um, term to use. We call them craft programs or do-it-yourself programs or, you know, even story times. So I'm going to talk to you about why we should do it as public libraries, how we should do it, and do we really have to do it? So why? I kind of gave you some of the whys, why the public library. Um, but now I will share with you more in-depthly why. And part of it is um, the, this screen that I have in front of you now about um, STEM learning and how the United States is falling behind um, even some undeveloped countries um, in producing uh, people that have a good sense or, or knowledge of mathematics, engineering, technology, um, and science. And President Obama has done a big initiative on STEM um, education and STEM technology and STEM research. So libraries naturally kind of are, are go in and fill that gap. And through the ages, libraries have filled gaps in um, education systems and um, other agencies. Um, for example, we are tax form providers, and we are now going to help with the new um, Health Care Reform Act. So these partnerships and then maker partnerships are, are very logical for libraries. We often collaborate with the schools, with universities, and with businesses. And this helps not only the library retool itself and the library remain sustainable, but it also helps the economy of the community and the vitality of the community, and even globally. So I'm going to give you a little more information about STEM education, but I've actually taken it from, it went from STEM to STEAM to STREAM, so I've added um, to the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, I've added the reading and the arts because it's, it's a comprehensive um, literacy. So whether it is knowing code or understanding um, the genome, personing, um, climate change, research, etc., people need to be able to understand multiple technologies even as a base, in a basic level in order to make decisions to stay informed and participate in commerce, democracy, and society. So literacy on its broadest term. Libraries have a long history of hosting workshops about making and building literacies. Money management, computer skills, wellness fairs, those have been in our history for a long time. So here's some def a definition of STREAM. STREAM actually acknowledges that basic liter literacy is no longer just reading at a grade level in your native language. It is so much more. It is bas basic literacy includes science, technology, reading, engineering, arts, and mathematics. Maker spaces promote learning through play. And so do libraries, hence story times. Many of you probably went through two story times as young, young people. They have the potential to demystify science, technology, math, engineering, and art. And they can encourage women and under, underrepresented minorities to seek careers in these fields. That is so important as we look to our future and look at what um, our community needs and globally. They tie into the trend of self-production, self-publishing, and indie artists who are bypassing traditional venues to produce their works and who are going directly to the web for their audience. For example, uh, the Fifty Shades of Grey phenom, um, well, whether you read it or not, um, it started out as fan fiction to the show, um, to the Twilight series. And so this woman in England just started, you know, writing, blogging about it. And, um, you know, now she's a multi, 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 multi millionaire. And, um, and she skipped, you know, all the publishing process. She just started doing this, you know, on her own. Well, now she's obviously got big publishers and, and people behind her and a movie deal. And um, incidentally, there was a town in Maine that was basically um, shut down. Um, it was a paper, 
a paper milling um, town, and because they were, they, it was their town that was asked, and their com the company in their town was asked to produce um, the paperback copies of Fifty Shades. That town is now thriving. So, little history there, little little segue to different things. So, how how are libraries going to do this? The Fayetteville Free um, Library was the first library uh, to have a makerspace. It's the first public library to have a makerspace, I should say. And their philosophy is that um, to make the library of the future. And they called it a fab lab, and then they kind of moved it into, now they went from fab lab, which they still have, also into a creation lab, which is a digital lab where people can produce, um, you know, publish, uh, books digitally and um, produce music and that kind of thing. And it started up with grant money, as most make, library maker spaces have, um, but they also got donations from local tech companies for equipment. For example, their 3D printer was donated from a local tech company. And while they wanted to have space in their existing building, they, they wanted to carve out um, space within their current library, they just weren't sure how to do that, and so they actually made a mobile lab, and they took um, their maker space, their original maker space, on the road and out into the community, um, to community centers, to retirement centers, to schools. And currently, they um, are have funding and have received a very large grant, nearly two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars, for a building project where they're going to actually actually incorporate a makerspace within their new building. Now the Allen County Public Library in Fort Wayne, Indiana um, did it a little differently. They actually, um, there was there is a nonprofit tech company um, in Fort Wayne called um, Tech Venture that um, needed a space or wanted a space for their makerspace. And um, they just couldn't afford anything in kind of downtown Fort Wayne or in a good space. So the library reached out and TechVenture reached out and they made this collaboration of a makerspace and it's actually a mobile trailer that they attached to the south end of their building um, of the main library in Fort Wayne, Indiana and um, that is now the operating makerspace and as you can see it's about a 50 foot square, um, 50 square foot um, trailer so it's a pretty large um, and they have a lot of really good equipment. But again, this was an actual makerspace um, venture that linked up with the library. And it's a win-win for the library and for tech venture because the library reaches new users and can move into a more active learning environment. And there was no upfront costs to the library at all. And then tech venture has an affordable and centrally located space uh, to work out of. And while most um, makerspaces within libraries are free to the public and open um, to the public and many different age levels. This one actually, you have to be a member of Tech Venture um, to be able to use it. And it is open to families, but they, you know, kind of restrict um, the age. And then the Detroit Public Library. The Detroit Public Library's teen area is actually called HYPE, um, the HYPE Teen Center. And it is, when you walk into the main Carnegie building of the Detroit Public Library, it is right there on your right-hand side, and there's a big sign that has the rules of the Hype Center. And it says, only people 13 to 18 years old can, can use the space. So it is truly geared for teens. And while the, teen, the entire Hype Center opened um, and was re-renovated in like 2007, the actual hyper, um, the actual maker space area was done in 2011. And it was done through grant money and donations from large corporations like Carhartt and GM. And um, now the administration funds it with $11,000 per year, not including personnel costs, because they actually hire, um, I think, one and a half full-time equivalents to operate the, um, the makerspace within the hype and they have paid mentors that they get from the community, um, retired GM workers, retired um, factory people that want to come in and help and 
one of the things that they do is a whole is a fashion, and they have a sewing machines. I believe that's what Carhartt actually donated to them. So they do a whole fashion show. So they have people from the community come in and and aid with that um, with sewing machines and with the fashion. So and I think they pay their mentors fairly well, um, if I recall. And here's just another picture, and that's a picture of um, some of the robots that the kids that attend the Detroit um, Hype Center, mostly after school, have created. And they get a, a good um, amount of people in there right after school, which is nice because it's a very urban environment. It is on the bus route. So East Lansing Public Library, what, is, what are our vision? Where are we going? Well, actually on Saturday, we are starting our very first code camp for kids ages 7 to 10 years old. And it's four weeks um, of Saturdays throughout July and August. And the kids will come in and learn basic coding, basic computer programming, and learn how to solve problems through computer programming, computer coding. And then they also get to uh, build, a, build robots, which we will unveil um, at the National Night Out event with our Touch a Truck program. So they'll have their little robots and we'll, with the big fire engines. So it'll be kind of exciting. Then this fall, we are um, partnering with Impression 5 Children's Museum to offer um, what is going to be called Fab Saturdays. So five weeks to six weeks of Saturdays throughout October, probably early November, where um, kids ages 9 to 11 years old can come in and um, learn about circuits and they're going to build an entire city that lights up. So we'll have a big unveiling for their parents and all their friends, um, and we'll um, cue down all the lights and just have their city um, lit up. So that should be, that's just the first of hopefully many collaborations with Impression 5. And then in fiscal year 14, which just started on July 1st, we are hoping at um, the East Lansing Public Library to have the funds to create a digital lab and we're going to take an existing space and hopefully buy uh, Apple computers and some digital processing um, equipment and open up a digital lab um, for our patrons. So that's the first step. But the future. My future vision is to have a maker space in downtown East Lansing across from the Michigan State University where we can collaborate with the city, with businesses, and with the MSU with the Broad Art Museum and um, have a space that is both um, kind of um, a mini library or a satellite library, if you will, and then a maker space. So the majority of the, the function of that space would be for a maker space and, um, and another touch point for the community for um, a, a literacy touch point on the broader sense. So and multi-generational programming there. And one of the things that I have really been working on um, since my tenure at East Lansing Public Library is to, our tag, to make our tagline the, that the library is the community's classroom. And this fits perfectly within that. So there's a picture of some of the cool stuff that the kids who are attending our code camp on Saturday um, will hopefully build. So. so how and startup costs? Well, the startup costs can be anywhere, I mean, most, most libraries are using grant money. And they can be grants for, you know, under $20,000 to up, upwards of $250,000. And then you really have to have the commitment of your community and of your administration and, um, you know, area businesses for ongoing funding. And as Christina mentioned, you can, your space can be anywhere from a table or a couple of tables to more than 8,000 square feet. The um, U Media Lab at the Chicago Public Library is a huge space. And, um, you know, so that, that's something to kind of grow into. But you can start out very basic. You can start out with, you know, your basic 3D printer and Mac computers, Lego Mindstorm, Snap Circuits, and then move up to something much bigger. And again, collaborations. Collaborations are so important, so important for the economic development of a community, but also for um, the citizens of the community and for the sustainability of the library. 
And again, using mentors and um, East Lansing is such a rich place to get those mentors and to get those volunteers because of the university and those who have remained here um, and retired professors and beyond. And also um, people from the auto industry who are in the area. So do we have to do this? Well, <laughs> if you've been listening to me, I would say yes. <laughs> um, I would say absolutely. And um, this is why we have to do it. For the young people who are coming up through our community. And um, this picture is actually um, a picture of, the, of my um, head of IT, three, three kids. And um, they actually each have their own iPad and actually each got their own iPad at the age of six months. So they are far beyond me and far beyond probably um, not to insult anybody, but most everybody who's listening. So, so I'm going to pass it back over to Christina to wrap up. Thank you, Kristen, for, for this discussion. So based on all these aspects, uh, in our coloring plan, we do argue that a makerspace program developed by a public library would be an appropriate direction in furthering the innovation ecosystem in our community. And as Kristen really emphasized um, the importance of a, a partnership network in developing such programs. In today's economy, communities need to be efficient in allocating limited resources and avoid duplicating efforts already taking place in the region. And therefore, various collaborations with regional partners will enable the library to provide high quality maker workshops and experiences to its patrons and benefit from diverse expertise and skill sets already available in the community. And this suggested partnership network could uh, include the public library, local makers groups, uh, local educational institutions like the universities, community colleges, the public schools, economic development groups, um, innovation centers, museums like the Impression 5 in Lansing, arts councils, local organizations involved in innovation and creativity, and the private sector. All these partners have specific strengths such as expertise, access to tools and equipment, which could be shared with the public library in various maker-related programming. And this concludes our presentation. Uh, we would like to thank you for your interest in this exciting topic. Uh, and before we open up for questions, I just want to let you know that more information about this uh, topic and resources are included in the upcoming coloring plan of makerspaces. And uh, if you have any questions about this presentation, uh, do not hesitate to contact us at the phone numbers and email addresses that are on the screen. Thank you, Kristen, Lori, and Christina. That was fabulous. I, I think that this is a lot of information, um, but I, I think that it's probably going to become more and more important to understand um, the makerspace concept and how the many different ways that you can implement it. Um, I have a few questions and comments myself. This is My name is Jennifer Bruin. I don't even know if I introduced myself, but I'm, I'm the coordinator on the REI program. Usually I do, but forgot. Um, so I'm going to open up the question box or the chat box and see if we've got some questions in here for any one of our presenters. So if you have questions and comments, go ahead and enter them now. Okay, well, then we have a few participants in the room. Um, I don't know if they have, does anybody have a question or comment here besides me? Um, and I'm actually just relaying some comments that I've heard from people as I've been promoting your webinar. Um, I had someone ask me, well, how many makerspaces are there already in Michigan? I might have missed it, I know I left the room for two minutes, but do we know what the total is? I mean, any type of makerspace. No. We don't really know a total, but we do know that Ann Arbor has several, Detroit, Kalamazoo, Grand Rapids, and then um, Nancy Baker. Um, Your hunch is that there could be, what, 20? Could be. I mean, absolutely, there could be. Like I have a library all over this, but they're 
right are also part of the lead of the maker in the internet. I think uh, they seem to be the ones that are visiting this the most. Yeah. Well, and people think they're in the garage. Yeah. 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 Um, the other comment that I had someone ask me is um, how often are we seeing these maker spaces in the disadvantaged communities? I know one of you mentioned um, it seems to be, and I know we talked about it before the webinar started, it seems to be maybe something. Is kind of low cost as far as startup. So, how many do you think, once again, this is just a ballpark, are in Detroit, um, Mount Elliott? I would not say Ann Arbor is probably high on the list of disadvantage. Um, and I just went to the New Media Lab at the Chicago Public Library, the Harold Washington Library, downtown Chicago, and they, are, they have opened up eight more maker labs um, for, for kids in some of their locations, and I think they're going to spread it. And I know that the Columbus Metropolitan Library is working on Makerspace, uh, San, San Francisco, Los Angeles, all of them. So, um, and, you know, as a public librarian, I would say that we want them. You know, we want those touch places for um, everyone. We want them in places that, you know, we, as librarians, we try to kind of equal out um, the gaps or fill in the gaps for um, of technology and of um, information. So I think you're going to see more and more and more of them. Okay, and we've got a question. Well, thank you for answering that about the. Um, I know that for REI, our focus is really to help out the the communities that don't get the attention. So a lot of our topics we try to bring it in. Well, that's why we're, um, you know, the hope is that more women will be, mm -hmm. you know, educated in, in the STEAM stream um, yeah. disciplines and more um, underserved minor minorities. Yeah, good point. Okay. Is there acceptance, this is a question that came in on the question box, is there acceptance and resources at the state level for local libraries to appro approach now? You know, there, there is grant money out there. Um, unfortunately, you know, many libraries don't have the um, people on staff to write grants, but there, there is a commitment from um, the Institute of Museum and um, Library Services, which is a federal, Grant, grant process um, to get money for um, STEAM, STEM um, education and maker spaces. Um, and I'm laughing because I came from the state of Ohio that had actually very good state funding for libraries and it, it distributed um, grant money a little differently than Michigan does. But I think, yes, I think what it's going to take is some research and I think that's what Lori and Christina um, have been doing with this report. Um, is looking for money um, that we can we can apply for and get um, to start a maker space or to expand a maker program. And I think that as we you know continue to get more visibility for maker spaces and an understanding of the economic development potential of the maker space, then that will bring in different funding sources than potentially libraries have seen in the past. And I know the Library of Michigan is committed to this. Um, they don't see it as a fad. Um, they, they, they understand that this is probably um, going to carry us through, into the future. So I have a question about the potential audience for makerspaces. I've yeah, heard you talk about everything from young kids that doing even projects with Legos or things, simple things like that, mm -hmm. up to adult inventors of you know, garage better type people and everything in between. So the maker spaces tend to focus on a particular level of audience or are they typically across the board bringing together inventors, experienced inventors with just potential possible future inventors? Yes. <laughs> um, all of the above, exactly. Um, and I'm just speaking from, um, from my experience with um, membership makers, maker spaces and the public library maker spaces and that is um, many kind of folks start out focusing on an age group, adults or children or teens as um, Detroit has. Uh, but they then once they get funding or once they can expand or have the resources then they kind of broaden that and open it up.
The Fayetteville one actually um, is open to all levels. The Fayetteville, New York um, makerspace is open to all age groups. My hope would be that um, if we do one East Lansing, it would be open to all age groups and really um, concentrate on multi-generational programming. I will, I will also add that most of the makerspaces that provide workshops or training classes, uh, usually members will share their knowledge, their expertise with other interested. That's where I think the neat sense of community would be built at that makerspace when you have a retiree getting down to the level of a 12 year old and they're tinkering around with some batteries and lights and wires and whatever and they're building something and then they see each other maybe the next week and the next week and how they create this relationship or maybe the 12 year old brings in a couple of buddies one week they're getting the exposure to this guy that has all this knowledge that they would have never met if that makerspace didn't exist. I think that's... And that's what's happening in Detroit. That is really what's happening in Detroit. And um, I think that's the beauty of a makerspace. Yeah. And diversity is always a good thing. I mean, Absolutely. whatever, wherever aspect we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't be surprised if one of these experienced uh, garage inventors exposing things to little kids who sometimes think outside the box, might get some ideas from the kids as well as the kids. Yeah, no, and, from, and that's what yeah, is being experienced, absolutely. The kids aren't afraid. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And one of the cool things about the um, U Media Lab in, in Chicago Public Library is that they allow um, kids to check out video cameras or equipment and go out on the street yeah. and produce, you know, movies, documentaries, and then come back and show them. And, um, you know, what a perfect environment for that. So. And they wouldn't get that environment if they were in shop class at 10th right. grade at the high school, which of course doesn't exist anymore, right. but they wouldn't get that exposure. Right. You know, and the retiree or, or being able to use really expensive equipment outside of the school, that's just unheard of. Right. Right. So we need donors. We really do. We need people who can give equipment or give um, tools and help start this or or give space, um, you know, and, and money's not out of the question. I don't see any more comments um, from our outside guests. I don't see anything there. So, um, does anybody else want to ask a question? I know I was thinking about the robotics and science of MBA and all these things that are offered through the school, but, mm -hmm. but this is something they could literally, I mean, I'm thinking younger people. Well, they could take their robotics knowledge also, and when they're not in the robotics group, they could go to the library and you know, do their own thing. Okay. They don't get the opportunity to do that all the time, so that would give them a lot more exposure. Are there any examples of makerspaces working with school systems, either colleges or at any level? Yeah, and actually I, I think the Chicago public is actually really working on that and working on reaching out into um, into the schools, and that would be my hope too. I mean, my hope is to have, you know, um, FRIB come to the library, yeah. and um, then for us to collaborate with the East Lansing Public Schools and um, do maker classes mm -hmm. um, for the school kids. Yeah, yeah. Christina, your training thing you just mentioned that would make sense. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, mm -hmm. kind of more formal. This is how you do something. Mm -hmm. you know, I know for myself, if I would have walked in there, I might feel a little intimidated, even though I might have an idea in my head, whoa, maybe I need some training before I touch this stuff. Well, and I want to share that maker programs, like I said, libraries have been doing them for years and years and years, and so you don't have to think about robotics. You don't have to know how to do robotics, because some of them are sewing, some of them are quilting, yeah. knitting. I mean, those are all maker programs um, where, you know, they just weren't called that, as I said. So. Um, I certainly don't know a darn thing about circuits except for what I learned in you know high school science class and that was too many years ago and I don't know much about robotics but um, and I know very little about computer coding so I happen um, you know I'm going to sit in on some of those Saturdays <laughs> at the library with the seven to nine ten year olds and learn so. um, but but that's the beauty of it it doesn't matter okay so I think probably wraps it up and more in the co-learning plan, right? So they need to go to the co-learning plan and, and read it or come to the summit and hear 
more? Maybe maybe you've gotten a little further in some of your research, or so. yeah, by then by September. We um, do have a couple of other webinars coming up, and let's see, probably four or five of them. I would check our REI Center website to see when those are. I think we've got one July 31st, um, August 1st, August 28th, 29th. So there's several on the different co-learning plan topics for 2012-13 project year. Um, but thank you very much, Christina and Lori and um, Kristen. We really appreciate you guys coming in and, and presenting all of your great work. And good luck with getting your makerspace up and running soon. Donations, 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 right? Over and over again. We'll keep repeating that. Okay, so thank you, participants. And um, we recorded this webinar, so we'll be transcribing it, and it'll be up on our website in maybe a week or two. And we'll send out an alert to let everyone know so that you can pass on the link to others if they want to learn about makerspaces. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time.